Hello, this is Kurt Frankum, and many of you know me as the host of the Leading Saints podcast. But Leading Saints isn't just a podcast. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we strive to create quality leadership content for Latter-day Saints in order to help them be better prepared to lead. With this mission comes a lot of expense, and we need additional help to continue our efforts in the coming year. In order to exchange value for value, we have created the Core Leader Community. To become a core leader, all you have to do is become a subscribing donor, which might be a monthly recurring donation or even a quarterly or yearly donation. For those who become a core leader through a subscription donation, you have access to our Core Leader Library, which includes additional recorded interviews not available to the general audience, access to all virtual summits, discounts on products and conferences, and access to a private CoreCast feed where you will hear additional leadership thought and behind the scenes happenings. We are a community of leaders making this happen, and we need you a part of this mission. Text the word LEAD to 474747 in order to become a core leader today, or visit leadingsaints.org slash donate. Welcome back to the Leading Saints podcast. My name is Kurt Frankum, and I will be your host. Now, if you're new to Leading Saints, we welcome you. This is a podcast where we strive to help Latter-day Saint leaders be better prepared to lead. And I hope if you're new that you'll subscribe and jump in. And there's a lot of episodes here, but uh, they're worth every minute. I promise it. Now, uh, in this episode, we talk with Robert Millett, a famous, well-known name in the church. You often see his name on books in church bookstores, especially Desert Book, who is his publisher. And he is most recently written his, I think it's like 88th or 89th, or he's in the 80s somewhere as far as, as how many books he's written. But this book is called The Holy Spirit, His Identity, Mission, and Ministry. I had the opportunity to read this book and was highlighting and and taking notes and tagging and trying to remember all this content because it's it's phenomenal. And so luckily, I get to not only read this book, but I get to sit down and have fascinating conversations with the author, Robert Millet. And so we did that at the corporate headquarters of Desert Book in downtown Salt Lake City. We met up and had a deep discussion about the Holy Spirit, but more particularly of how the Holy Spirit uh, in the context, as far as how what we should understand about the Holy Spirit in the context of being a leader in the church, especially in the bishop's office or when we're missionaries or how we testify and what the role is and just further understanding that doctrine of the Holy Spirit because, well, it's an important one. So I hope you benefit from this conversation as much as I did. You're going to love it. Here's my interview with Robert Millett, the author of The Holy Spirit, His Identity, Mission, and Ministry. Today, I'm in downtown Salt Lake City, sitting down with Brother Robert Millett. How are you? I'm well. Good. Now, I can call you Bob. I know you go by Bob. Is that all right? My friends call me Bob. You can call me Robert. Okay. We'll no, call I'm you. just kidding. <laughs> you call me Bob. <laughs> Maybe by the third interview, I can be uh, on that level. Bob but. is great. Great. Now, I know uh, we had the opportunity to record an interview uh, a few months ago, maybe about a year ago, and mm-hmm. that was received well. And uh, there's always a new project in your life. Is that right? Well, yeah. There always seems to be something. I go through bookstores looking for what no one's talking about yeah. much, you know? And you have a long list of those topics that you I hope had. To it, it's getting shorter. It is good as you get through <laughs> as my book. life gets uh, shorter. <laughs> good. Well, good. And uh, you've most recently written the book, The Holy Spirit, His Identity, Mission, and Ministry. And it's uh, available at all uh, church bookstores, primarily at uh, Desert Book and obviously on Amazon and those uh, worldwide bookstores. But so what was the impetus of tackling this this doctrine? Well, I've been fascinated for years with the work of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And what occurred to me that got me thinking more seriously about this, I was sitting one day thinking about a typical Sunday. How many times would you hear an expression like, in a prayer, bless us that the Spirit may be with us, or bless so-and-so as she speaks that the Spirit will guide her remarks, or bless all of those who are here that we will be guided and touched and instructed by that same Spirit. And what hit me was... The Holy Ghost is involved in everything. You would have trouble finding a facet of the Christian faith in which the Holy Ghost is not intimately involved. Hmm. And because of that, it's so common, and I don't mean anything bad by common, but so frequently referred to and and, uh, discussed, I don't think we we appreciate just how in and through everything it is. And so Hmm. I thought, if I remember, I think I did a series of talks on this in, in, uh, at an education week, and, and it was received well. And I thought, 
maybe there's something here. So I went along the lines of, what are the functions of the Holy Ghost? What are the facets of the Holy Ghost? What does it take to get and keep the Holy Ghost? What is it? What do you have to do to lose it? And what's the worst way to lose it? And so forth. And so it all began with a, the consideration of how involved is he? And the answer is, he's in everything. And I'm just curious, when you approach a doctrine or a subject so vast, like where do you even begin to, and, and what are some of those routines or strategies that you use to really make sure that you're covering the topic effectively? Well, it starts with my sitting down with a, a tablet that I keep with me at all times. And, and I just begin saying, if I were to write a book on this, what were the things that would just have to be in that book? Hmm. And I'll make, I'll make a list. And as the days go by and the weeks go by, I find myself saying, you didn't mention this, and so I'll slip that in. Or I'll notice that I have numbers three and seven are basically the same thing. Oh, okay. And so over a period of weeks, that list of chapters, the table of contents essentially, gets formed. And then I begin asking, I'll take a particular chapter and say, now in a chapter on obtaining the Holy Ghost, what ought to be in it? If I were, if I were, Reading a book, what would I expect to be in a book on that area of the, of the faith? That is, what does it take? Or if I have a chapter on quenching the Spirit, what it takes to lose it, what are some areas that ought to be covered? Then I'll ask, well, what are some prophetic statements or scriptural passages that teach that particularly well? Hmm. And so it's a bit of a bit of a branching outfit. I find myself thinking, yes, now when I've done this, then you need to deal with, and oh yeah, the scripture so and so comes yeah. to mind. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure by the end, by the time the book is is printed, uh, you don't you're not able to put all of that in one book, right? No, that's a problem. Almost any book, especially something of this sort, you start with the presumption of delimitation. Yeah, you just, it's there's no way to cover. It's like the book I did on Joseph Smith and precept upon precept. I, it's just too big for one book. And so I had to decide which things will I leave out. And that's often painful. Yeah. But it's also probably a healthy exercise to really start you know, zoning in on what are the really core parts of this doctrine that yes. are most important. And, that's right. Yeah. And along the lines of, are there things that are unclear or misunderstood that we know of pertaining to the Holy Spirit? Yeah. I know just throughout my time as, as a leader, especially when I was in a state presidency where you had that state conference every six months where knowing that I was studying in a way that I, at the end of all this study, I had to stand up and present. It really helped me formulate my thoughts and, and seek a deeper direction because of that. And so I would imagine it's the same thing that maybe somebody out there could mimic this process of though they may not be writing a book or end up giving right. a, a talk on it, they having that goal of how do I how do I formulate this down to the essence so that I can articulate it? That reminds me too. That would be another facet of the preparation of an outline is asking myself, what experiences have I had with this? Mm -hmm. Or what experiences am I aware of that church leaders have had through the centuries, you know? Yeah. And so those are the kinds of things I would plug in. And as time goes by, I find myself saying, I just don't think this is necessary. It's not that big a deal. Uh -huh. I know uh, when, I, when I decided years ago I wanted to do a book on prayer. And why? Because as I walked through the bookstore, there wasn't a single book on prayer. Huh. Now, pretty good, Im important subject. Okay? Right, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, but there was not a book on the shelf. Now, there had been a, a collection of general authority talks or insight articles on prayer that made it into a book called Prayer. But that's like 1978 or something. <laughs> it's okay. time for another book. So I thought, let's, so I sat down and I took about two days to put together a lengthy outline of what I projected would be about a 300 page book on prayer. And the more I worked on it as I began the writing, I found myself saying, is this part that really, that, that really, is that just important at all? I mean, is this, does it matter? By the time I finished, I had a 120 page book on oh, prayer. Nice. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, but ne definitely a, a helpful exercise to go through. Right? It is because you start asking, has this ever come up? I mean, is this something that's ever going to matter to anybody? And yeah. you start saying, probably not. Yeah. So was there one specific chapter or as you sat down initially that you were really excited to write about as it relates to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to talk at some length about the relationship of the members of the Godhead. Hmm. And that, that was probably my first impulse. What do we know from prophets and scripture about how the members of the Godhead relate? Is there an ordinal relationship? That is, for example, in a 
conservative Protestant perspective, say an evangelical Christian perspective, no one is greater than the other. There are three co-equal, co-eternal beings that have always existed, as it were, or at least the Father and the Son have. Mm -hmm. And yet it's very clear to me in, in the Gospel of John, Christ is constantly saying things like, my Father is greater than I. I come not to do my own work, but the work of my Father, or my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. It's throughout the Gospel of John and mentioned occasionally in the synoptics. But I first wanted to, to address that. Interestingly, the other one I wanted to do a little more with was, what about sons of perdition? Hmm. What, do, what do you have to do? <laughs> <laughs> not that you want to qualify. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need that roadmap. Yeah. But, uh... And I wanted to see if I could find out whether research had been done on the question of, is there such a thing as a daughter of perdition? Oh, yeah. And so I did confine that to a note in the book. But the fact is, the leaders of the church have gone back and forth on this. Hmm. Some say yes, some say no. Interesting. Some say a person must have the priesthood. Someone says the priesthood. You don't need the priesthood. Joseph Smith says you need the Holy Ghost. And so that's, it's good to know that there's no position on this. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. And so that one I was interested in. I wanted to make sure that I did something, too, on worthwhile on the light of Christ. We talk about it. Yeah. I wanted to be able to talk about it. what is the relationship between the light of Christ and let's say the influence of the Holy Ghost. Is that a different, is it a gradation? Is it, is it a, um, a growing amount of spirit? It's all God's power. Right. God doesn't have to say, okay, why don't you, why don't you switch into uh, Holy Spirit for that one and let's have you switch into priesthood for that one. I yeah. think it's all God's power. Yeah. And yet it's administered in different ways, different facets, different amounts. And I came across the passage in, in uh, Mosiah 18 that we've read a thousand times about the covenant of baptism. But what I hadn't paid any attention to was, why not be baptized, Alma asked, that the Holy Spirit may be sent upon you in greater abundance. And then it hit me. That's what he's talking about, the gift of the Holy Ghost, which you can only have the full measure of the Holy Ghost following baptism. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's obviously differences in, in, in these words and, yeah, and how right. they're explained yeah. and, and the administration of them, right? That's right. And so those two or three, four in particular, and then as I began getting into it, I began thinking, oh, you've got to have something on this or you must deal with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and suddenly you have a book, right? <laughs> suddenly you have a long book, yeah. <laughs> well, good. It takes a lot of writing and rewriting, yeah. You know, and I'm just thinking, I, I, my mind goes to a, a state conference I was in once and there's a visiting authority, I think it was Elder Golden, just randomly remember that, but. And he opened it up for some questions to the Saturday evening session. And uh -huh. obviously, this is, this is a risky uh, move for Always a general authority, move. right? Mm -hmm. And I remember the first question was in relation to, you know, will the Holy Spirit ever have a body? And explain that. Because it seems like there's some parts of doctrines that it's interesting. And if there's a question, that would be, or if there's an answer to these questions, that'd be fascinating. But a lot of these doctrines, you can go down certain rabbit holes that really don't matter, right? Or, or maybe they do matter. They either, they either don't matter or there's just not anything on this. Right. The one you just mentioned, for uh -huh. example, when we were planning this book, uh, myself and the, my colleagues at Desiree Book, we were wrestling over a subtitle. Holy Spirit seemed like a good title, but subtitle. Yeah. And one of the words they wanted to make sure that was in there was his identity. And I said to them, it's going to be a really short chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I'm aware of about two statements from Joseph Smith on this, and that's what's in there, yeah. that chapter. And so, yes, we need to know who he is, but that doesn't take a long time to say because not a whole lot has been said about it. Yeah. And so really, with those questions, I mean, if someone went to a priesthood leader and asked something like that, I mean, how would you suggest they respond? Like that question? Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd probably respond with, we really don't know a great deal about it. I'm aware of a couple of places where the prophet Joseph Smith said that the Holy Ghost will eventually receive a physical body because he's a son, a spirit son of our Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. End of what we know, as far yeah. as I know. There's that, there's that chapter. <laughs> I haven't even come across any general authorities that ever even speculate beyond that. It's just, that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. So I want to maybe dive into, you know, as with a, a leadership audience listening, you know, there, there's certain doctrines and principles that we learn in primary and, and, and as we develop in the gospel and, you know, that the gift of the Holy Ghost, it comes at baptism and, and so forth. And then when we are put in these leadership positions, not only do people come to us with some questions like that and others right. that maybe do have answers, but 
we sort of gain a deep or, or we seek for a deeper understanding of these things. So you talk about as far as losing the Holy Ghost, you know, we, we often hear this, that we have to be worthy for the Holy Ghost. Obviously, we receive the, the gift of the Holy Ghost after baptism. What does that, where would you even begin, what, what does it even mean to lose the Holy Ghost? Well, I think, I think when, we, when we commit sin of a magnitude that is offensive to the Spirit, then we feel that Spirit's influence less. I don't think it's complicated. I just think we feel it less. And it's interesting. I think the Book of Mormon uses language like, you, with, you do withdraw yourself from the Holy Spirit. Mm. He doesn't have to withdraw himself. You withdraw yourself by mm. serious sin. And so I think when I, and I, and I think I'd say it this way too, that the finer, the more, the more, more refined our lives become, the higher standard we have to live. Mm. In other words, the slightest deviation. For a person that's really living a holy life, the slightest deviation from right into wrong will bring great pain and an absence or a kind of a, a chastening. Yeah. Um, and so now, on the other hand, a person who is just getting back into activity, let's say after years of being less active, it seems like the spirit is much more patient. Yeah. Yeah. And encouraging. And right? Encouraging. You'd hope so. That's right. Yeah. So that the, the slightest thing, I, I tell a story in here and it was a, it was a sobering one for me of an experience I had with when I, the first time I was bishop with a man in our ward who was excommunicated for immorality and it was serious. I worked with him and the stake president worked with him over the months. And he came in to see me at about the second month and we chatted and I said, how are you doing? And he said, Bishop, I never knew how much light I had until I lost it. Hmm. And then he said this, it's so dark out here. Hmm. And then he added this, and I, I don't want to establish doctrine with this, but I think it's a fascinating point. He said, I even enjoyed the spirit to some extent while I was sinning. He says, now I feel so dark. That is, following severance from the church, following membership being taken, he was what he, and he literally was experiencing what is called the, the buffetings of Satan. He was being pushed around and 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 he felt just vacuous. It was there was just emptiness he felt. And his greatest desire was to get that spirit back. Yeah. And so I, I think he's probably right. He probably had a measure of the spirit that he felt even in his moments of doing what he shouldn't do. But I think, on the other hand, if you're if you're living the gospel and you're doing better and better at it, that the Holy Ghost is trying to raise you to a higher standard. Yeah. In fact, there'll be a certain point where you don't have to commit sin; you just have to pause on a plateau for for for, for too long. Hmm. You follow me? Yeah, yeah. Remember, President Kimball said it, we've paused on some plateaus long enough. Well, that's a that's a, an important statement because it's saying you can't remain neutral. You yeah. won't remain neutral. You go backwards. Yeah. Or you go forward. Yeah. It's like you can't take a vacation from the spirit. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, or you can't take a vacation from the church. You're going to lose. Yeah. Now you, you may be released from a position and you're not quite as involved as you were before, but you just can't set the spirit on the, on the shelf and say, I'll come back later. Yeah. Yeah. It just reminds me like one instance I had as, as a, a bishop, there's a, a couple across the street from me and I knew, you know, their, their records are on, on the rolls. I, I knew that. They had a connection to the church and, you know, so I, I made a connection with them and, and encouraged them back and to the point where this young man, you know, no kids yet, newly or young married couple, this young man came to my office and was willing to have a conversation with me. And he, he told me about an experience where I think he'd been through a disfellowshipment of, of some type. And he told me that his YSA bishop got to a point where he mentioned to this young man that, well, you can't receive personal revelation because you are unworthy of the spirit. And this was such a interaction that was just so shaming to him where it felt like he was more saying you are unworthy as a human and as a person that you don't you you don't get any of this this spirit, right? And I assured him, I, I felt good in the moment to say, you know, no, like you you need a relationship. Your your savior and your father in heaven is reaching out to you for that relationship. So there's sometimes we we simplify these doctrines so much that we think we make that it black and white, but right. it isn't black and white. Right. It's and, more on a continuum. Right. And so I guess my question is like in those instances where church discipline and, and serious sin has been committed, like what sometimes we use the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as sort of like a, a stick to beat them with a little bit saying, well, you can't have this doctrine now and because you don't have, you know, the quote, you know, quote, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so right. 
how can we better facilitate that conversation with encouragement rather than, you know, pulling this doctrine away from them? I think we can talk to them about the fact that what they're what they do feel feel on certain moments, which they assume is the Spirit, is, and that the Spirit is working with them. Mm-hmm. You know, there's an interesting phrase in Scripture. This is another thing that was good to do more research on, and that is, the phrase is, my spirit shall not always strive with man. But I had to come to appreciate that the prophets have taught that isn't referring to the light of Christ. It's referring to the Holy Ghost. Mm. In fact, the Holy, the, the light of Christ strives with us. Now, think about that word, strive. It's related to the word strife. It battles with us. Hmm. It battles to, to get us in shape spiritually, to prepare us for better things. The Holy Ghost doesn't battle with us. If I were talking like I talked in Louisiana, I'd say, Holy Ghost won't mess with you. <laughs> 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 yeah. Meaning you'll begin to feel less of that spirit when you sin. The light of Christ You'll never lose the light of Christ. It'll always be there. So there will always be an element of spirit trying to prompt you and move you toward greater light and greater knowledge. And so, yeah, I don't think there's ever a time when a person doesn't have a measure of God's spirit. Yeah, yeah, because I've even talked to many individuals who, you know, one close friend of mine who's uh, uh, currently excommunicated and kind of going through that process, and his experience has been, wow, you know. This has been such a sanctifying process for me. I feel I feel close to the Lord. You know, I don't I've never had this feeling like I am in the dark or I feel that connection. I feel that guidance sure. of the of the spirit. And so sometimes it's hard, like you said, you can't get in the black and white territory with these doctrines. Well, that's right. I I think it's it's why we why there is something to the idea of a portion of the spirit. That's a Book of Mormon phrase. Hmm. A portion of the Lord's Spirit. I, not long ago, a man came up to me, I'd given a talk, and I used that phrase, and he said, there's no such thing as a portion of the Spirit. I said, well, you better talk to Alma, because he sense, tends to use that expression a good bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all it means is, you may not have the fullness of the Spirit, but you'll have the Spirit. That's a portion. Hmm. Okay? And so, yeah, I think, I think that, uh, I'll give you another illustration. People outside our faith. I've heard this a hundred times, if I've heard it at all over the years, and that's this. We are the only people that still believe God speaks to man. I don't know how we started saying that, but I I know too many people of other faiths. I've spent 25 years of my life working with them, and I'm telling you, they have the Spirit. Now, do they have the gift of the Holy Ghost? I'd have to say no. That comes after uh, authorized baptism and Mm -hmm. confirmation. But they certainly have a Spirit with them, and it's God's Spirit. And to say they don't have the right to inspiration, I, I what kind of a father would do that? Right. Of yeah. course they can pray and get direction. Of yeah. course they can have their prayers answered. And so I think the proper way of saying it might be, we're the only church that still believes in apostolic oversight and that that the church and the leaders of the church at the highest levels are receiving ongoing revelation. That's where we distinct. But to say we're the only people that believes you can have inspiration, that's just not so. Yeah. They all believe that. I mean, I would hope that they would live in such a way that the Spirit could guide them. And, right. And, and it does. Yeah. And especially, you know, you talk about outside of our church, if there's a, you know, Baptist minister who feels inspired to start a church and I mean, they're that Spirit's going to motivate them in that action, right? Because could anybody listen to Billy Graham preach and say, oh, yeah. he just doesn't have any spirit? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't want to walk up to the front and, and do an altar call, but at the same time, I was always very moved. Oh, yeah, said. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's an example of an oversimplification re- uh, relative to the spirit. Yeah, and I think we really just have to be careful of that, especially in these leadership positions, that it can come across as very shaming when there's no shame in this process at all. It no, should be encouraging. No, right? repentance needs to be upward looking. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It also, in my mind, like the typical, you know, eight year old baptism ordinance. Uh, you know, typically grandma and grandpa speak about the Holy Ghost, yeah. right? And there's always this default to the doctrine that this is our, you know, in, in primary terms, this is our special friend. You'll now have a companion to go with you. And and sometimes that's where we simplify the doctrine saying, well, if you don't get baptized, you won't have a companion, you won't be, have guidance. Where I feel like the stronger doctrine is less about having a special friend and more about the cleansing agent of the, the Holy Ghost, mm-hmm. right? And to me, that's the, to, if we can get that doctrine across to the the developing faith in our in our church that that's why we go to church. We need that cleansing agent every week. Agreed. Right? And and as I mentioned a moment ago, we also want to have that spirit with us more abundantly. Yeah. Even more than I have it now. I yeah. Want, I want more, you know. 
Yeah. And even for the temple recommend holding individual who's who's quote unquote worthy, there's still an abundance that he can reach for. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, it's it's an infinite there's a it's a, there's an infinite gradation of spirit, yes. And so it, it really doesn't help people to say, You don't have any spirit and you never will until you get baptized again. Yeah. Well, that makes no sense because they have to at a certain point begin feeling the spirit to prompt them on this and help them with that. And so yes. Yeah. Yeah, can't be sure. oversimplified. Any other um, is for, uh, related to this doctrine of the Holy Spirit is as it relates to repentance, the repentance process that would be worth mentioning. Yes, I think I think the one that comes to my mind is this: either members of my ward or students in my classroom over the years, the question that has been asked again and again is, "How do you know when you can stop repenting of this? How do you know when the sin is forgiven?" Hmm. And I think it's a really good question that we need to answer more regularly. And the answer, I take them to the fourth chapter of Mosiah in the Book of Mormon. We read the first three verses. These people have heard Benjamin deliver the words of the angel about the coming of Christ, the atonement of Christ, putting off the natural man, and so forth. And the people respond, you know, they respond to what is, they, they said, we believe all the words you've spoken. We know of their surety and truth. What the people do when Benjamin finishes that, what we have is the fourth chapter, they basically are prostrated on the ground and they say, we, how do, how do they put it? May the, the, the atoning blood, may we be cleansed by the atoning blood of Christ, that his spirit might be with us. Well, the account says after they had done that, one, they had peace of conscience, two, they felt joy, and three, and anyway, there's a series of things. When I've asked, when I've asked young people, we'd read that in class and I'd say, okay, how do you know when the spirit's with you again? No, I'd say, how do you know? From this, your your sins have been forgiven. They'd say, well, you feel peace of conscience. Good. Another one, you feel joy. Good. Anything else? Dead silence. So we got down peace and uh, joy. Anything else? No. The Spirit came to, with, came to be with them again. Hmm. Meaning, if in fact, if a man living in sin, if you can say that no person, as the Scriptures say, the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in a person that's unclean and impure, then what does it mean when the Spirit's dwelling with you again? You're no longer unclean and you're no longer impure. Hmm. The Spirit is the Lord's way of saying you're back on course. Hmm. And a larger measure of the Spirit is the Lord's way of saying you're back on course. I don't think we press that enough, which is, as I finish this book, the thing which is so clear to me is, let's don't complicate this. It's very simple. Don't do things that will offend the Spirit. If you can, If you can live a life like that, then the spirits can be with you, and what that means is you're on saving ground. If you were to drop dead right now, you're going to go to paradise and enjoy celestial glory one day. Why? Because, as Paul said, the spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, the earnest of the spirit, meaning it's God's earnest money on us. It's God's statement to us: "I'm sending my spirit to tell you, to certify to you, I intend to save you." Hmm. And if you can keep the spirit with you, you're right on course. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I guess that leads me to the question of where's the grace in all this? Because sometimes it can feel like your relationship with the Holy Ghost, you're always it's always this transaction. I'm always trying to earn you, yeah. right? And so where does the grace of it all fit in to this doctrine? Well, when we're working with someone, for example, who's in transgression, or if I'm working with myself, I'm in transgression, I begin to appreciate that the forgiveness comes by virtue of the, the spilt blood of Jesus Christ, the atonement. Mm-hmm. The atonement of Christ is what accomplishes forgiveness, but that the Holy Ghost is the medium by which that's accomplished. And in that sense, the Holy Ghost, as you mentioned, becomes the cleanser. He becomes the sanctifier. And so what the Spirit does is when my sins are forgiven, I'm living in a justified condition. I'm in right relationship to God. And at that point, from that point forward, the Spirit continues to work on me and work on me, and I become a little more pure and a little more holy, and that's the sanctifying process. That's a lifetime process. But over time, you continue to keep that spirit with you, and as the spirit, the spirit begins to reveal new things to you, yes, but the spirit begins to work on your conscience. And there are things that you cannot do now that you had no problem doing five years ago, mm-hmm. which means your conscience is being educated and your desires are being educated. And your judgment is being developed so that at a certain point, you don't need a major revelation on something. You can pray about it, but it's very clear you knew already what was the right thing to do. Yeah. And so I, I think 
as we know, and we have to appreciate that it's through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ that it takes place. The Holy Ghost is an act of the Lord's grace to us. Okay, The Spirit is a grace. It's a gift to us. That's why it's called the gift of the Holy Ghost. You can't earn the Spirit any more than you can earn salvation. But you can put yourself in a position to receive the gift. Meaning, in this case, you know, how does the Book of Mormon end? Deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you. And you become pure and you become holy. Yeah. That makes makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I see it often that I equate that and maybe it's attached to this doctrine as far as the love of God that, you know, that there's, as far as like earning God's love, obviously God loves us. However, to feel a higher level of that love, that comes through these sanctifying processes. That's right. right. And so I've often said it this way, the sun doesn't stop stop shining because I put a, a bag over my head. It's still shining. Yeah. I've just blocked the light. And so it is with God. He doesn't stop loving us when we sin. He loves us through it. I mean, you only have to take this to a, your own personal level. When your children do awful things, do you say one day, that's it, I no longer love them? <laughs> yeah. Right. No, you love them. He loves us through it all. But there are certain things he can't do for us in the same way. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the love is forever there. But when a person lets themselves get into serious sin, they're not going to feel the love of God in the same way. Yeah. It, the love of God's there, but you've put the bag over your head and you can't see or feel the light anymore. Right. And that, to me, uh, connects to, I think you did a whole chapter on the doctrine of justification and sanctification. And, and I really feel like this is at the core of our doctrine, yeah. but we miss it a lot because it's so easy to see things in the justification side of things of, okay, do, am I justifying to receive the Spirit? When in reality, yes, you are always justified to receive the Spirit because Christ justified you. Yes. We're in the sanctified area of things. That's right. and, and, and the justifying thing, you can know when you've been forgiven of sin, as we've talked about. Mm-hmm. The sanctifying is such a slow process, as President Benson once said, the person may not even notice the changes that are taking place. Yeah. Sometimes it takes someone else to say, man, you are really changed. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? Because it is slow. It is a slow process. And the changes are are in many cases imperceptible, but they're real. Yeah. Now, at the certain point, you can look back on your life and say, my gosh, I have come a long ways. But you didn't feel those little pieces of progress as you were taking them. But yeah, the Spirit is something we grow into. Yeah. That, that's the way the Prophet Joseph Smith described it when he says we learn the Spirit of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's such a helpful dynamic, you know, in the when you are mentoring somebody through a transgression or whatever is like remove the black and white of you either have the spirit or you don't, or you made this decision, therefore you don't have it. But no, like Christ has justified you and you're in that process. So now you're sanctifying yourself through actions and through the atonement of Jesus Christ that uh, you're going to figure out how to actually change so that that spirit is, uh, so you can feel a higher level of that spirit. I think, for example, the role of a bishop or stake president, there are many roles, but one major role is to guide the process of repentance And to help that person by saying things, and it's true when you can sense it, saying, you're making progress. Mm. I can see it in your countenance. And it's very real. You see somebody, they're changing. They may not appreciate that they're changing, but you've seen it. You can see it in them. And that's one of the roles that the the priesthood leader, the the, uh, legal administrator plays, is helping that process move forward and tutoring the person in sin along the way. And really is focusing on that you're not progressing in order to earn your way back into heaven. You're progressing so that you can feel a higher level of his spirit. That's right. Right? That's right. Because that can be such a shaming state to be in that I'm cast out. I am no longer counted among among his children, right? And that, that's where the adversary wants you to be. Well, and there's this, there's this passage in the Doctrine and Covenants that people take the wrong way, you know. It's the idea that if you, that if you sin, the love of God... You will not experience the love of God. Well, again, that means not that God doesn't. He's not that God stops loving you because you sin. It means you can't feel the love of God in the same way. Yeah. Again, you've distanced yourself. From right. It. Yeah, that's powerful. Anything else as far as justification, and sanctification, be worth mentioning? Well, it's surprising how many times, especially in the Book of Mormon, you'll hear the prophet that's teaching or speaking refer to a forget that our sins be forgiven. And that we can be made pure. 
Well, there's your two processes. Our sins are forgiven, justification. Mm-hmm. We're being made pure, sanctification. Yeah. And they're there and we just, we, we don't see them sometimes. Yeah. And, and it's such a fun exercise, you know, as far as the, the clean heart and a pure, clean hands, a pure heart yeah. dynamic dichotomy that's, that's throughout right. the scriptures. That's, that's fun right. to look for. And the other, the other thing that's interesting too, is this notion in the Book of Mormon of obtaining and then retaining a remission of sins. King Benjamin talks about that in chapter four of Mosiah. He says, and now for the sake of retaining a remission of sins, and he then described it's kind of two steps he gives. One, he said, always acknowledge God's greatness. Always acknowledge the fact that you're an unprofitable servant, that without him, you're nothing. Acknowledging my nothingness and he's everything. That's the process of living in a state of perpetual gratitude, Hmm. state of gratitude. If you can live like that, always acknowledging God in all things, you're going to remain in, in a justified condition. The second thing Benjamin mentions in verse 26 is the other way you become able to keep that spirit with you forever, to retain that remission of sins, to retain that justified condition through the care of the less fortunate and poor. Hmm. If you want to retain your remission of sin, get out and serve people. Yeah, it's powerful. So I want to shift to um, another dynamic that I, two areas that, and I don't know if this is the right word, but sometimes we, we weaponize the Holy Ghost in certain ways and, for example, maybe somebody, and not weaponized, maybe we use it almost as a, a way to manipulate situations in, in whether in our favor or in the favor of, of the person. So, for example, someone may come in with some, some strong doubts of, you know, some of the tenets of the gospel. And so we feel like, you know, there's been several stories where the uh, the believer steps back and boldly gives a testimony and 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 our hope is that we're sort of projecting the spirit upon this person to to change them and their thinking before our eyes. And even, you know, Elder uh, President Ballard has mentioned, you know, gone are the days where we simply testify and these answers go away. So what do we need to understand about that dynamic of sort of trying to project and aim the spirit of people in order to, to change them? Is that a thing? I don't think so. I, I think what happens is if I'm sitting with a person who's wrestling with the faith issue, wrestling with a historical question, wrestling with a doctrine question. I think in many cases, to come on really strong with testimony is, again, almost a shaming mechanism. Mm -hmm. I think they need to know that I believe this with all my heart and that this has been particularly the way I've come to appreciate this and the way I've come to understand this is as follows. And I do believe it's true. I don't think you overpower people with, with the Spirit. I don't think you I don't think the spirit allows us to do that. Mm-hmm. I think it would be a, I think would be in many ways a sham to, to think if I could just either speak loud enough or, or use the holy tone uh, enough times, they're yeah. going to come around. No, you can't manipulate the spirit. It's like a person saying, prepare yourself, brothers and sisters. We are going to have in our Sunday school class today, we are going to have a great spiritual experience. Well, I wonder if the Holy Ghost isn't somewhere saying, oh, really? <laughs> Let's see. Why? Yeah. Because you can't manufacture the spirit. Right. You can't manipulate the spirit. You can't elicit the spirit. We can set the stage. We can prepare the room. Maybe you're maybe you're playing beautiful tabernacle choir music as the people are coming in. Whatever. But you can't force it. Yeah. You can't force testimony. Elder Packer said that you can't. Words like force, compel, do not describe our relationship with the spirit. In fact, he goes on to say, do not be too eager to gain great spiritual experience. He said, seek to help it along, but be patient and don't force it or else you'll open the way to be misled. Hmm. In other words, it's not the, the Lord's spirit. It's another spirit. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think there's what you're mentioning here is very true. And I think Elder Bittenar has even mentioned this, that the phrasing we use that, you know, receive the Holy Ghost, it, it's you, an individual has to receive it. It That's can't right. be forced upon and, and right. you can set the stage, right? And, right? and hopefully you can stimulate that, but it can't be forced or contrived. I think it's perhaps related to this verse in the third chapter of John, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. Well, wind is just one translation of the word pneuma in Greek, but is also translated as spirit and breath. And so if he's saying, the spirit comes and goes as it will, and you can't always control it. 
Yeah. And I think that is an important lesson. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have it with you. What I've come to appreciate, it's two different things, to have the Spirit and to always feel the Spirit in the, in the same way. They're not necessarily the same. Yeah. Someone, for example, I've often noticed this among religious educators who do this daily, the odds are they're not going to come out every hour on fire. Right. And yet, the students were deeply moved by what they had to say. And their wife says to them, well, Bill, how did class go? And you say, well... Frankly, I was kind of bored. I didn't hear much of anything. <laughs> Just another day at the office. Yeah, another right? day at the office. But, <laughs> but you had students write you emails and send you texts saying, oh, that's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. Does it mean he didn't have the spirit? No. It's just that we're not going to always feel it in the same way. Yeah. And that's the beauty about this doctrine is that not everybody in the room has to be on their A game for it to work, right? Yeah. I'll hear people say, too, you need to have, in order to have an effective class, you got to have everyone making a comment. You cannot allow people to just sit there quietly. And I found myself saying, what? Sometimes this person back there that's sitting quietly is doing some serious pondering on what's being said. And so there's another example. I don't think you, we're, going, we're not going to create a spiritual experience for this person. Yeah. And that he speaks out doesn't mean he's learning a great deal. Yeah. And so I think it all has to do with we cannot manufacture or monopolize the spirit. It's, it's not within our grasp to do that. Yeah. Another scenario sometimes we maybe try and create a manipulative situation is, is Anthony Sweat, a BYU professor, calls it the spiritual trump card, where let's say a typical scenario, you're in a ward council meeting, you're debating one aspect of whatever it is in, in the ward, and the bishop or somebody else in the room uses the phrase, I have a strong feeling that, yeah. and then fill in, fill in the brain, right? And so that like trumps it like, well, you can't, there's my trump card. You can't argue that because I have a strong feeling that, right? And that completely implodes the, the council setting. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with you totally. I'm reminded of a, a colleague of mine at BYU for many years, told me of an experience where his younger sister had come to BYU to go to school. And in her ward, this, this fellow walked up to her one day and said, uh, you need to know that it was, it's been made known to me that in the pre-mortal life, you promised <laughs> to marry me. <laughs> he laid out all the trump cards he had right there. <laughs> and she looked at him and she said, well, I may have made that mistake once, but I won't make it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, no, I think, I think that it's not only cruel, it's wrong yeah. to do that. I think we have to be very careful about the things like, I feel impressed that. My old buddy Joseph McConkie used to call it spiritual grandstanding. Hmm. A teacher stands up and he or she is teaching, and suddenly the teacher says something like, I sense that there's someone in this room that's feeling this, this, and this. And so what I'm about to say is just for you. That's spiritual grandstanding. Hmm. And I've always said to, to the faculty when someone had asked me about it, I said, look, teach what you feel impressed to say. But just don't tell them the Holy Ghost just gave me this because that's being almost boastful. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it, it's like you say, it's, it's arm bending. It's saying you better pay attention to this because it came from the Spirit. No, if it came from the Spirit, give it, deliver it. Just don't announce it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. And, and I would imagine that, again, there's nothing wrong with using that phrase, but I think that's a, maybe an opportunity for a leader to say, you may have that feeling that we should go that direction, but I'm sure someone else has a feeling to go in the other direction. And let's talk about that because that's how we can get to some some serious inspiration. Agreed. Right? I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Now, I, another dynamic that we, and this is one I, I've really struggled with, so I'm interested to, to dig into this and, and get your perspective. Sometimes we, as our roles are required, sometimes we are tasked to make callings in the ward, right? And so, and like you said at the beginning, the spirit is almost in everything, right? This doctrine is everywhere and it's, you know, influencing us in so many directions that we probably aren't even aware of a lot of those directions. But sometimes it feels like there we are in a bishopric meeting and every last decision we feel like has to be made through a prompting or the, the guidance of the spirit. And so we may be praying about, you know, the, the, third Sunday teacher that's going to teach twice a year, whatever it is, and we nobody can move until we have received specific inspiration and revelation for that calling. And at the end of the day, we've been set apart and ordained. Can't we just make the call and move on? Like sometimes we, we have to co-everything in yes. this came through inspiration or we cannot move on. What, what are your thoughts on that dynamic? When I was a state president, I, uh, 
we were having an effective, I thought, uh, bishops training meeting, monthly meeting, and one of the bishops said, every decision that is made, every calling we make, we pray over individually. Now, this is a student ward, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but those are some you long meetings. Often, <laughs> you know how often yeah. you have to, you'd have to be on your knees to fill callings every week because people are moving. Yeah. You know? I said, I really wouldn't go there if I were you. I think that's, I think that's going to be a backfire on you. And here's why. Did you pray to start the meeting? Did you ask the Lord's Spirit to be with you as we make important decisions? Does that not suffice? Yeah. I mean, is that everything requires an independent prayer? I don't think so. Here's the other thing I want to say about that. It began dawning on me some years back that there'll be those times, those seasons where each of us pass through what I call seasons of unrest, mm -hmm. where you just don't feel as close to God as you did before. And as far as you can determine, you haven't done anything awful. You haven't done anything wrong. You're just not feeling close to the Lord for some reason. And it doesn't even mean that you aren't. It's just you're not feeling it the same way. Well, I think one day we're going to look back on our lives and, as I used to say, watch the video and notice that during those times that we were feeling most alone, the Lord may well have been with us very close, closely yeah. with us. I think what we're going to look at and realize is that as we strive to keep the Spirit with us, if we try to live our lives in a way that the Spirit can be with us in an abundance, then gradually over time, the Holy Ghost shapes your judgment. The Holy Ghost forms your sense of reasoning. The Holy Ghost, as we indicated, educates your conscience. So that before long, you're able to sit in a meeting and it just feels right that Sister Joan should be called to do that. You didn't necessarily have to kneel down and pray about it right then. And what we'll find one day is that those statements, those decisions that we make, were inspired. How so? Not necessarily that the Spirit had to come and prompt me again, but that the Spirit has formed my judgment, has yeah. formed my, my thinking. In other words, so that what I do come forward with is good judgment. Yeah. And it's proper. It's what the Lord would do. And that it's almost too spiritually excessive to pray over every item. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem right. Elder Oaks, when he was uh, years ago, in fact, spoke at BYU Devotional and said uh, he knew of a situation where a man and his wife, when they went shopping, the, the man always had, went to the store with his wife because he wanted to pray over every can that they purchased. Hmm. Elder Oaks, in his subtle way, said it, it seemed a bit excessive to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, and it's actually crazy. It's gospel crazy. It's just not necessary. So I think... I think that, that the Spirit can guide you in a meeting and that you don't have to pray about every single thing. Yeah. I think it could drive, I think you'd wear yourselves out. <laughs> like I said, a student ward and you start over, or a young people's ward and you start over every semester, you got a hundred callings to make. <laughs> Your knees are going to be bruised. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> And I really appreciate that. And it goes back to sort of that doctrine of sanctification, like the, the one way that the Holy Spirit influences us is through that sanctification process. I often wonder what experiences did I have 10 years ago that meant nothing then, but have developed me into the person to make a certain decision today exactly in a certain right. way, right? That's a good way to put it. I, I think the Spirit prepares us today for decisions we have to make tomorrow. And Going back to the callings that I often see it that I refer to as the chalkboard in heaven. We put so much pressure on ourselves that, as maybe a bishopric that, that God has this chalkboard in heaven with every calling that in our board. And he has a specific name next to every every calling there. And, it, and it's our job through the spirit to determine what's on God's chalkboard so that it can be on our chalkboard. But a lot of times I would say that, am I wrong in thinking that maybe there's two or three people that could feel that like calling and God really doesn't doesn't have an opinion one way or the other. You know, let me give you an illustration. I've seen this happen many times. I knew state presidencies to be called. And uh, in the days and weeks preceding that, two or three different men, good men, men that definitely are not seeking to be the state president, get them. Mm -hmm. No, only one of them. Right, there's only one spot. <laughs> I think that's the Lord's way of saying you would be perfectly fine as the state president. Yeah. Meaning your life is in order. Now, that may not be who's called. I'll share this story, and this could be misunderstood. I hope it isn't. Joseph McConkey shared with me once that when his father had returned, his father Bruce had returned from a 
a state conference call, uh, assignment. As they were sitting down to eat, he, he turned to his dad and he said, Dad, do you feel confident as your brethren go out and call new state presidents, do you feel confident that, that that man is the Lord's man? Elder McConkie's response is very interesting. He said, oh, no, but once we call him, he becomes the Lord's man. Hmm. That's a great principle. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now, I could see where people could misunderstand that, and I hope they don't. But I think it's, I, you know, maybe to be called as an apostle, there's one. In fact, God has in mind. But, sure. but as far as who's going to be the home evening leader, not that it's unimportant, but that maybe you don't need a major revelation for that. Yeah. And I think Elder McConkie's point is very interesting. Once that person's called, the Lord fits them to that assignment. Yeah. Isn't that a great concept? Yeah, it is. And I think there's in scripture in uh, 128 verse 9 where it talks about this bold doctrine that, you know, we we often see revelation as a one-way street from heaven to us, but oftentimes we make the decision and it goes to heaven and then is stamped as revelation. I think that God honors his servants. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and oh, I was going to mention just that oftentimes we, we, we rarely say that this individual is called by God, but they are called of God and of his, his process and of his, of his doctrine. Right. And exactly. I, I think that's helpful to, to see there. So, exactly. well, this has uh, been a fun discussion, insightful for sure. Um, Always enjoy it. Yeah. And any other aspect as far as it relates to leadership in the church of the Holy Ghost? I mean, obviously there's, could be a whole book on that, but anything that you'd want to mention before we wrap up? Maybe something that comes to my mind is something that I, I talk about in the book toward the very end, and, and I, I keep making reference to my old friend Joseph McConkie. I miss him. But we learned that he and his wife Brenda had been called to serve as mission presidents to preside over a mission in Edinburgh, Scotland. Not long before they left, my wife Shauna and I, who, had, who were good friends with the McConkies, went to uh, the park and had dinner with them. Just sat around very casually and enjoyed ourselves. And I remember turning to Joseph and saying, have you, have you been through everything that's been sent to you? And of course, he'd been sent volumes of things to read and a conf- or, excuse me, addresses by the general authorities to new mission presidents from previous times. He said, yeah, I've been through it all. I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, and this is back when the little white handbook, uh, the missionaries rules, the do's and the don'ts uh-huh. was there. And he said, I've, been, I've gone through everything, and I've gone through this, this little book. He said, uh, there's good stuff there, and it's certainly correct. He said, but I've tried to come up with something that could distill the message in that little handbook and in the missionaries' lives. Is there something, he said, that could cause us not to worry about keeping 63 rules? Is there an overarching guiding principle that ought to be involved here? He said, what I came up with is this. He said, I want to teach my missionaries to understand this. I would never do anything that would cost me the influence of the Spirit of the Lord. And it sort of became a mission motto. And I think, my gosh, if we could live by that standard, I would never do anything that would cost me the influence. That'll affect places where we go and don't go, things we say and don't say, people even we affiliate with and shouldn't affiliate with. It's a powerful statement. Now, I think for those called to positions in the church, especially priesthood administration, it isn't they're called to be superhuman, but they are called to try to align their will with the will of God and to live in a manner so that the Holy Ghost can work with them. Because it is, it's not just now that the Holy Ghost can work with that man to be a better man. The Holy Ghost now works with that man to help make others better men and better women. And so it's a, it's a sobering responsibility to be a priesthood leader. It's sobering to be a leader in any facet of the church. Why? because souls are precious in the sight of God. And so there's a beautiful little saying in the Book of Mormon where in the 26th chapter of Mosiah, Alma has just, Alma the elder has been delegated responsibility as high priest by King Mosiah. And he's overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed with transgression in the church. He's never encountered this before. So what does he do? He takes the transgressors to the king and says, here, I brought them for you to judge. And the king says, no, I deliver them back to you to judge. In other words, that's why I called you. It says, and now the spirit of Alma was again troubled, for he feared that he would not do right. Hmm. That is so moving to me. I know that feeling. You know that feeling. When you're dealing with people's lives, we're going to make mistakes here and there, but there's some things you just don't want to make mistakes with, and one of them is a person's soul. Uh, Joseph Smith said once, 
only fools would trifle with the souls of men. So I, I think as a leader in the church, we strive to the best of our ability to not do anything that will cost us the influence of the Spirit. That concludes my interview with Robert Millett. Thank you to him for sitting down with me and having this interview. You know, I hope there's a third one in the future because I always enjoy learning from Robert Millett and, and sharing it with you. And uh, did I miss any questions, any perspectives or thoughts that you would have asked during this interview? I'd love to hear it. If you go to leadingsaints.org, find the episode, this episode, as it uh, is posted there, and you can actually post a comment. We'll make sure Brother Millet sees those comments and responds to them so we can get a further dialogue and understanding about this uh, sweet, rich doctrine of the Holy Spirit and how it is enriching and sanctifying us in our mortal experience. And I'd be curious to know, if I did interview Robert Millet again, what topic, or is there a specific book that he's written or topic that he's researched or talked about before, what would you like me to cover with him? And it'd be uh, fun to get those questions sent in, and you go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and send in a message to let me know what the next Robert Millet interview should be about. And remember, text the word LEAD to 474747 and join the Core Leader community today. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness, the loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.